we should start. I see the full room, and I think I, I know why. Uh, because uh, most of us uh, have seen uh, uh, ambiguous lesions most, uh, a lot of times. Most of us wondered uh, whether the result of our procedure is optimal. And I think all of us have sometimes feelings that the tools at our disposal are, are not enough. Uh, so I think that's really, really, it's going to be a very interesting session. My name is Maciej Leszak. I'm from Poznań uh, University Hospital in Poland. And I have a privilege to co-chair this session with Dr. Hiram Bezera from the United States. Uh, and we also have two fantastic discussions, uh, Dr. Joost Demen from the Netherlands and uh, Thomas Johnson, Tom Johnson from, from UK. Uh, so I think during this session, it's worth staying uh, till the end of the session because you will discover the benefits of fully optical approach, uh, optical both imaging, but also uh, uh, physiology with opto free wire and HF, uh, Nipro HF uh, OCT uh, catheter. Uh, we will review through a practical cases uh, the value of coronary physiology and intravascular imaging in bifurcation PCI. And, and then you understand how the performance and accuracy uh, of opto wire 3, the fiber optic wire, uh, uh, can make a difference in uh, fast and reliable decision making process, especially uh, about bifurcations. Uh, we show you a technique when we can really uh, jail jail the the the, the opti wire in a, in a, in a side branch. So I think uh, don't let waste time. Just dive in uh, right now into technology overview. So uh, Tom, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. So the other thing, just to emphasise, is this is obviously a relatively small room, but it's also an interactive room. So. If you go to 241 on the PCR app, you can engage and ask questions throughout uh, this session. We'll do our very best to answer those for you. So thank you to uh, Opsens and Neatpro for the opportunity really to share with you then this very exciting technology uh, combining both physiology of Opsens with the imaging potential of Gentuity. These are my potential conflicts. I'm afraid as ever I always return to the UK practice being a UK physician, but it's interesting to look over the last few years that we see physiology is really embedded in UK practice with a very significant number of uh, interventions guided by pressure wire. We see actually quite a growth in intravascular ultrasound and not quite such growth in OCT. And I think there are some issues in terms of technology barriers and education that we need to address. It's important to reflect that imaging and physiology, I think, to do two different things at present in intervention. One, to guide decision making with physiology, and the other to guide procedure by imaging. But actually, we're now at a really exciting crossroads, I think, where we bring both together to give the best possible outcome for patient. So if we consider this, we have 20% image guided PCI in the UK, 10% physiology guided PCI in the UK. If I reflect on my practice, I'm sorry not to give you the most contemporary data, but we see probably about a 40% imaging use. It's now around 70% in the most recent year. But that red bar indicates where I'm using both physiology and imaging together. And that's continuing to grow, but at the, remain, at the, at the present time remains relatively niche. I had the great privilege last week to actually use the Gentuity OCT system in our practice in Bristol alongside the EPS OpSense technology. And this was one of the cases, I'm afraid I won't have time to share all of it with you, but it very much emphasizes the benefit of these new technologies. This was diffuse complex LAD diagonal disease. This, the purpose of this session was to also look at the role in bifurcation and Maicek will uh, share with us some of his valuable insights in terms of the use of OpSense in this setting. But actually, we confirmed by physiology significance in the LAD with a DPR pullback showing a significant step across that mid-segment. And unsurprisingly, we also showed significant disease in the diagonal, which I have to say in bringing this patient forward, I had hoped was less significant to leave a wire to treat provisionally and then demonstrate the benefit in bifurcation. This is then the Gentuity pullback. So those not familiar, we have the uh, image A-line in the large screen, and then we have a pullback showing uh, longitudinal extent of disease. This is 
100 millimeters, 10 centimeters acquired in one second with a, a manual syringe injection of only five to six mils of contrast. This is game changing. My initial plan had been DCB diagonal, provision LLAD with acknowledgement of calcium, but just prepared to use semi-compliant balloon technology. Predictably, or unpredictably, but unfortunately, intervention to the diagonal resulted in quite significant dissection, which we see in that middle panel, and disease that extended right to the ostium. You see from nine to six o'clock the, the disease-free carina tip of the LAD at about six, seven o'clock out into the diagonal um, where the probe is sitting. And so actually I felt a DCB to that diagonal would not give a long-term uh, result, and as a result had to convert then to a two-tenth two -tenth, two stent strategy. I don't like DK crush in anything other than left main, but actually the complexity of this disease did mean use of DK crush I felt preferred um, in this setting. I haven't got time to show you the final result. Here I'm going to um, interact with the most fantastic case next, but just to highlight that after I think uh, six runs uh, of uh, opsends, 11 runs of opsends, seven runs of gentuity, we result in the most incredible DK crush result with then benefit of seeing the increase in our DPR to 0.93 in both limbs of the bifurcation. So that's precision PCI harnessing both technologies. So how do these technologies work? Well, the OptiWire is the next generation wire. I did this DK crush technique using the OptiSense wire throughout the procedure. So I took multiple assessments. You can connect, disconnect, but it allowed me to continue to assess the impact of my intervention throughout the procedure, finishing then with those important results, 0.93 in both limbs. It behaves like a workhorse. It has excellent stable signal stability, which is something that in competitor wires isn't uh, so um, well maintained. One in three competitor wires showing a significant drift. And that drift, even two millimeters of mercury drift, can result in a significant um, inappropriate measurement or assessment of physiology. And as I've already suggested, this is connectable, reconnectable, with the ability for us to make real-time assessment throughout the procedure. How does it work? Well, it's an optical uh, core wire, so it, it enables uh, the, the construct of the wire to behave like a workhorse wire. It has this sensor housing rounded tip so it won't catch on stents. There certainly was no issue in this complex bifurcation. Um, it has a very robust shaft with this important uh, torqueability. So if we comp compare conceptually guide wire against a piezoelectric crystal type technology, we see this far greater one-to-one -one torque responsiveness of the wire. And in terms of its weighting, it has a similar weight to a standard BMW workhorse. So how about Gentuity? Well, it arrived in our cath lab last Wednesday, and I got to, got to uh, work on Thursday morning to do these cases, and the, the staff said, there seems to have been a delivery of a Tesla in the room. Now, we've got a lot of a kit in our, in our, um, in our cath labs, but the reality was it was quite a slick, a slick device. Where are we at? Well, first generation time domain obviously required long flush clearance of blood, we move to a second uh, generation frequency domain catheter, which is the current Abbott and uh, Terumo systems, with a depth of penetration of 2 to 3.5 millimeters, so potential issues around left main stem imaging. And there's still a requirement for quite significant clearance of, of blood over a period of time. This th third generation high frequency technology overcomes many of those limitations. So we have now a catheter that is remarkably small. I'll show you on the next slide the difference between that and the existing catheter technologies. But also through the high frequency component, it allows us a depth of penetration up to six millimeters. So no longer are we concerned we may not capture full vessel. And the speed is transformative, 10 centimeters in one second with minimal contrast use, all enabled by AI technology. 
So here's the pictorial representation of the catheter against its competitor, and you see very, very much smaller. And the, the benefit of that, as we'll see in Hiram's case, is that we can undertake pre-intervention imaging without having to predilate. So this very tight lesion in the, in the mid-LED that I showed you earlier, here's the catheter sitting in with, within the lumen without really any compromise, and the ability to achieve 10 centimeters of excellent clearance. The catheter sits on a console into an um, interface unit on the cath lab table. It has a short monorail tip, much like uh, the competing technologies. But this depth of penetration really does uh, change what you can see. And here's just further iteration, really, of em emphasis on these techniques. Long pullback, large depth of penetration, ability to image into, into tight lesions. So this combination of optical physi physiology and imaging is really game-changing. It will allow us to really proceed with precision decision-making. This combination, I believe, will enhance outcomes for our patients. We have a wire that is equivalent in handling to your workhorse without that issue around drift. And we have then a catheter that will enable for us extensive assessment of arteries with minimal contrast and minimum time spent. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Tom, for, for this. Uh, thank you, Tom, for this great overview of the of this technology. Is my microphone working, uh, and I think that uh, we should uh, immediately move to the case just to 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 reinforce uh, the message. Yeah? So so to 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 connect the this technology with the our daily life practice. So uh, here I'm, please. Thank you, Matthew. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, common theme on this uh, presentation is going to be the usability and the comprehensive aspect of uh, pre and post uh, imaging and physiology. So in this case, you're going to have a little bit of more time to, to dissect all the details and, and hopefully interact. So as I go over the case, Please think about what would be your strategy based on angel only, and then I'm gonna give you some physiology and I'm gonna give you the intravascular imaging component. So these are patients that is a pretty common presentation in our labs, a non stemi presentation, to a point of five. Uh, in particular, he has uh, receive his stents in an outside facility that we don't have records, we don't have uh, films, uh, two years ago. Uh, we just know that he went through a PCI, but we don't have any detail of the procedure. So this is the, uh, the first uh, shot. You see a pretty severe lesion on the circ and, uh, and a moderate lesion on the LAD. Um, just based on severity, you need to bet your money on the circ, although there is no clear uh, acute aspect on the angiogram that you can pinpoint uh, the culprit vessel here. We start by interrogating with the op sense wire the, the circumflex. Uh, it's, there's a clearly positive FFR value there. So keep this in mind. Uh, this was followed by the HFOCT, this is just a fluorosave save to demonstrate how easy that cat across that very tight lesion, right? Uh, due to the low profile, as Don uh, clearly demonstrate on his talk. Then the pullback, I mean, if you pay close attention to the second mark, that second mark is flying at 100 millimeters per second. And, and you can really acquire this, this, this pullback with four cc's of dye. This is the pullback of the circ. You're going to confirm, obviously, a very tight lesion there. But importantly, there is no thrombus. So you can clearly rule out thrombus here, which beg the question, is this really the, the culprit or not? There is definitely some plaque that, uh, that is lipid rich. But uh, then we start focus our attention on, on the LAD, just uh, to hunt for a potential culprit vessel here. We start with the physiology. It's uh, borderline positive FFR. Then we did the uh, 
a GPR pullback that different from Tom's case, this one is more of a diffuse profile. So just based on physiology, not as appealing in terms of intervention. Then we did our OCT run on this LED. And as we start getting close to the distal board of the stent, you see a relatively small amount of uh, nail intima there. And on the proximal part of the stent, uh, uh, a significant amount of thrombus that you, you can't really appreciate this on, on, on Azure. That proximal part of the stent is under expanded. I mean, the lumen is uh, uh, below three millimeters in the proximal LAD. The stents are uncovered. There is some degree of malaposition. We don't know, again, because we don't have the baseline image if this is late acquired malaposition or, or as baseline related. But uh, either way, we believe that this is uh, probably our culprit vessel at this point, right? Uh, I'm going to pause here, uh, Tom, and, and give back to the case discussion. Uh, on the baseline before we go over what was actually offered on this case. Okay? So, yes, yeah, I mean, it's an amazing case with a lot of information, I guess, um, and so quite a lot to unpick, I think. Juice, what's your take on the information we've got? Physiology down both vessels, suggesting by FFR, certainly significant in both, but we have this diffuse DPR pullback across the LED, as <clears throat> Hiram says, suggesting that a stent may not be the answer. And then we have demonstration of culprit by OCT in terms of thrombus. Mm. Yep, so definitely a lot of things to say. I think what is, what is the first thing that I think critical to, to mention is that these ACS patients account for 60 plus percent of our routine practice, right? I mean, this is not a patient you may encounter once a year. This is 60 to 65 percent of your routine practice. Uh, of cases and we know that at least in one out of three ACS patients the culprit is not not so evident. We are not able to identify the true culprit based on angiography alone and I think that that attests to the concept of, of the combined uh, use of imaging and physiology in these cases. Uh, as nicely depicted here, I think the circumflex is a vessel that has an intermediate lesion, so this is something that would classify between 30 and 90 percent diameter stenosis based on and you are likely also on QCA. So those lesions may be FFR positive, but it's a circumflex. And we know that these lesions are also FFR negative in about 70 to 80 percent of the cases. So that's where I think the use of, of physiology in these cases is, is critical. Um, by combining the capabilities of the wire with this, this, this new OCT platform, you can get an impression not just on the plug type, but also on the severity of the plug. I think now we confirmed that this lesion is severe, both with physiology, but we also with imaging were able to demonstrate that there was no, uh, no thrombus. So this is a tight lesion uh, based on all the criteria we know, and maybe yeah. you can elaborate a little bit on that. I mean, for the, the purpose of showing this image particularly is this is the cardinal sign of a high burden lipidic plaque, which is an essential kind of assessment. Uh, not somewhere you want to be landing a stent, but equally something you have to take as being very high risk. So Just has highlighted this moderate stenosis, moderate severe stenosis, proximal circumflex. And here we see this very high grade stenosis. The problem is that we're all used to looking at an OCT catheter that actually would be sitting at that extent. And actually we wouldn't get contrast necessarily down. But the beauty is we have had a full appraisal 100 millimeters along this vessel due to the fact that we brought that technology down. But we then also have a vessel that is just full of lipid. Now that doesn't have associated thrombus. It isn't the culprit. But actually from a procedural perspective, it's critically important we recognize that as a potential for low flow, slow flow embolization. If we look at the corresponding OCT image from the LAD, then you know, in my mind, actually, imaging is mandated in the setting of stent failure. We mm -hmm. have an absolute obligation for this patient who has already been stented and failed their stent to make sure the next stent works properly. And we can only achieve that with imaging. It cannot be done by angiography alone. To the point that actually we had a discussion earlier where I said, you have also an obligation to consider bypass surgery as an alternative strategy here. The patient's failed stents once. 
why do we then pursue a revascularization strategy that may not be right for that patient? We've banished to image without intervening, without committing to intervention. We could stop at this point. We've defined ischemia, we've defined a culprit, but we could actually then convert to bypass surgery if that was the appropriate feeling in the room. If we demonstrate actually that there's a problem, we can understand mechanism of stent failure. And most importantly here, we see a stent that is only two millimeters in diameter, and yet in the proximal vessel, it's three and a half millimeters. So the mechanism of failure is a woefully underdeployed stent. And that actually gives us confidence then to pursue further intervention to this stent. We don't necessarily want to put another stent in, and that's where then combining this with the physiology and understanding now that this diffuse, rather than a, fo a focal step-up lesion, we know that actually more metal isn't the solution here. The solution is optimizing the stent that's already in situ, gaining better luminal gain and achieving a better minimal stent area will hopefully then provide for that patient a better long-term outcome. I wonder if there are any comments or questions from the audience. Any questions from the audience? Okay, if not yet, so let's please go back to the case. Yeah. Let's All go right. back. So we do have, just while you get that up, here, oh, there are okay, a couple of co some... comments on. So isn't there a distal LAD dissection shown? No, so that was well spotted, but that was in fact, if we go back to that OCT run, there is a blood swirl. So it's important to think artifact or real. Mm -hmm but you see on the run, there's just some swirling of blood at the very start of the pullback, which is, so that there is not dissection, but it's actually just yeah. swirling blood in association with contrast. And then how reliable is physiology in the context of ACS? I think I, I expected that question. Yeah, I, don't know. I think you have to be cautious that in the setting of a, a certainly acute presentation, there is a risk of the physiology under um, assessing the severity of the lesion. We're in a position here where both FFR values in the circ and the LAD were positive and therefore demonstrate the ischemic potential. But you're right that in a fresh event in the first few days, there is a chance that that becomes artifactually negative. Yeah, I, I would just add that uh, the idea of, uh, of underestimation would come in, in a situation of uh, very sizable infarct uh, with a lot of compromise of microcirculation. Troponin here, uh, five, and I think the the circ lesion, the fact that we are holding out thrombus and pushing away from the culprit, that becomes the non-culprit vessel and has uh, quite positive FFR actually on it. All right, so what have we done on this case? Considering the positive uh, FFR of the circ, we went ahead and um, direct stent, that lesion, there is no, no calcium. Uh, I, I definitely select a stent that would be l uh, longer than I would have choose based on uh, angiography. And we saw this in, in, in the light lab data that uh, you often change your stent selection if you do OCT pre, trying to find a better landing zone. So this was a direct stent, relatively long stent, deploy and post dilated with a 3.5 and C balloon at high pressure. So this is the angiogram post, uh, and we do this after all the post dilatation is offered and with the OCT inside. So that's a, a workflow that also help you optimize your dye, right? You don't need angiogram plus OCT run. Your angiogram is the OCT run. And that's what we, we found. There is no edge dissection. Then there is some uh, uh, tissue protrusion there and malaposition of the proximal edge. It's kind of optional if you're going to react or not this malaposition. Uh, I end up doing uh, uh, a pose view with a non compliant uh, sorry, with a compliant balloon for all millimeters. Nominal pressure is easy to oppose this. And it's interesting when you read there this 79% uh, here of expansion, you need to be aware that these struts are deeply embedded on that lipid core, right? So your expansion is actually more than that. You are just capturing some tissue protruding the lumen. So we're happy here with this expansion and no additional uh, high pressure was offered on that segment. 
because you, you, we are doing all this over the obstance wire, I mean, independent, what's the add value or not of physiology on the post here, we intuitively connect because it's, 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 it's literally five seconds. You reconnect the obstance and you'll get your DPR. Uh, and, and that's the, the physiological value of this uh, circumflex. Then we went to, to the vessel that is a little bit more complicated here in decision making here. But I think Ton already alluded to the fact that there is no tissue on that stent. There is already two layers of stent grossly un underexpanded. So probably the last thing that this patient needs is the third layer of stent, right? So we went with balloon only. Um, in US, we don't have access to, to drug cutting balloon. So it was a plain balloon, 3.5 NC. Uh, 28 ATMs just on that proximal part of, of the LAD. This is the OCT run after that ballooning. There is a significant lumen gain already. Uh, the thrombus disappear. We thought that we could make this lumen even bigger. We went back with a short 4 ONC. This time at 24 ATMs. And geographically, there is no much difference, but look at the difference on the cross-section of the OCT here. I mean, it's tremendous. We went from a 2.1 looming to a 3.6 after that uh, 4.0 balloon. The physiology, interesting, again, we reconnected, is unchanged, right? So uh, we are not intervening on this LAD because of the physiology. Right, because we defined up front that this was a diffuse pattern and that it probably no gain by, by intervening focal LAD. But rather, we were intervening on that proximal LAD because this was deemed a culprit lesion, right, and has all the, the milieu for second stent thrombose if, if nothing was offered on that grossly underexpanded stent. Uh, pause here again. Uh, for the discussion on the post. And I hope I didn't disappoint you guys on the strategy here. <laughs> so w one other thought that occurred to me uh, right now is how many doctors would just make a mistake and treat uh, only a CERC yeah, without, without imaging and physiology, especially without imaging, uh, leaving LAD like, uh, like it is, yeah, because uh, the lesion in the LAD looks rather smooth. Nobody would expect any, any thrombus there. Eh? And, and it would be a mis big mistake to treat uh, just CERC uh, leaving, uh, leaving LAD untouched yeah, in the setting, because the culprit uh, actually of this ACS setting was LAD, not, not CERC. Yeah. But I think then that's a very powerful message in terms of ambiguity of angiography. Yeah. And, and yeah, so. And you also, in the okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. And Zolt Pirot from Budapest. I would like to congratulate to your case and would just like to make one comment on the physiology and whether or not you made any difference in physiology. You showed us a DPR which was negative up front and an FFR which was positive and you intervened upon the lesion and you had an, a post PCI DPR of 0.92 the same. I guess if you had measured FFR, it would have been vastly different. Yeah. And it did make a difference, in not only in terms of morphology, but also in terms of physiology. So, uh, resting uh, indices immediately after PCI could probably be misleading. And this is not a resting condition that you're measuring, so it's partially hyperemic. So it's only FFR that can be compared pre and post PCI. I think there is a difference there, so you did definitely a good job. It's, it, it, will be shown by, it would be shown by physiology also. Thank you. Thank you, Zol. There's another comment here, Hiram. Would, would the use of IVL for the stent in the LAD been beneficial? Should we have been? Should you have considered IVL in a? Uh, yeah. So 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 it's interesting that uh, 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 I have to acknowledge that there is uh, white thrombus there, uh, but I think we had a, a good assessment even behind the stent that uh, we were not dealing with an extremely calcified milieu. Right, so uh, IVL would definitely be the next step if, uh, if the planned balloon would not do the work. Right, so we did a 3.5 short balloon NC at high ATMs, repeat the, the, the OCT, 
Uh, and again, this is not really adding much dye. I mean, uh, every run uh, equals four cc's of dye. So you can uh, stepwise your decision making. But definitely, if I'm not have this substantial lumen gain with a, with a regular NC balloon, the next step for me would be IVL. Yeah, and, and to extend from that, also, if we think back to the technology as we're emphasizing the change in this third generation is we have this greater depth of penetration. So we're now out to a vessel four, five, six millimeters if we want in terms of depth. And so you can see in the pre-PCI, we see this double layer of stent struts. We can see struts here, 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 all over the place. But actually in the deeper tissue, we don't see any uh, classical features of calcium, that very distinct both proximal and distal border to calcium. Actually all we see is fibrous tissue out into the deeper wall. So we can be fairly confident that this is not calcific. I think just to finally conclude on, on the fantastic work Hiram's achieved is we see, as he said, going from a 2.1 millimeter diameter to a 3.6 millimeter diameter. I would argue, as lost as about FFR, I'd argue we're not using diameter, we're using area as our potential cutoff. And so we go from an area that is probably 3, 4, 3.4, 4 millimeters squared, now to an area that is much more in the realm of 10, 11 millimeters squared. Now using an absolute cutoff is something to probably try and avoid, but we see this step change in terms of stent expansion, and that's what then gives confidence in terms of the longer term outcome for the patient, I think. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps one more uh, comment to, to, to a very important remark uh, Dr. Bezerra made. I think that this system, the NOCT system, may be the first one that will reduce the, the, the use, the, the, the amount of contrast uh, as compared to regular angiography. Because look, you, you, you inject very few, uh, very few milliliters of, of contrast for, to do the OCT. And after this, you don't need to repeat angiography with wires, without wires, this projection, that projection, because you know everything, you know much more than, than uh, nanon angiography. So you don't need to finalize with, you know, without wires, with two positions as, as we usually do. Yeah? So this system may actually reduce the, the, the contrast, not, not increase. Yeah? Right. Th Hiram, thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. So, the original objective for this meeting was to highlight the technology and the combination, and we had initially planned for that to be bifurcation. Now, I was in a hurry to try and do that in Bristol. As I've shown you, the case was only achieved last week, and so we'll present that another day. But part of the reason for that is there's some really good data behind the potential utilization of opsends in the setting of bifurcation. And so it's a pleasure to ask Maishek to present his, his experience. Maishek. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just briefly, one more case uh, from this time from my lab in, in Poznan. Uh, I have nothing to disclose uh, in relation to this presentation. So that's the elderly patient, 90 year old, year old uh, with uh, stable angina class two to three, with a couple of comorbidities, uh, PCR of right uh, uh, the same year, with mild aortic stenosis, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes, good ejection fraction, uh, uh, LV function okay. Uh, and nothing special in the um, in the ECG. So that's the angiography. You see, that's uh, right coronary artery and left. No much, yeah, no, 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 no special disease. So this is I will just show you uh, 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 left again because left will be our culprit. Uh, you see, there is something uh, there is something at the bifurcation of LAD and uh, and uh, diagonal. Uh, but of course, uh, we'll all agree that these are not very very f uh, tight lesions. So that's that's why we interrogated more uh, with, uh, with physiology. So you see, uh, to our surprise, uh, this is a DPR uh, with uh, Opsense uh, OptiWire 3, and you can clearly see that this lesion is very severely significant, 0.78. Uh, with, of course, diffuse disease, maybe with some, you know, drop of the gradient uh, or delta gradient around bifurcation. Uh, we did the same. Uh, so we, did, we, we started with LAD. Uh, then we pull back the wire uh, and insert the wire into diagonal and, and also po positive result, you see 0 0.8. Uh, 
Uh, so we decided that both lesions uh, should be treated. Of course, we can do it. We, we don't need to use two stents in this elderly lady. So, uh, and, and also a kind of diffuse disease in in in, in this vessel. Uh, so we started with predilatation uh, and C balloon 2.5 over 15. Uh, and you see the wire we have now in the LED is this uh, opti uh, fiber optic wire. Uh, up to wire three, uh, so the wire was left in the diagonal through the the, the, the entire procedure. So that's predilatation uh, on the right hand side. You see the the result after predilatation, and now stent uh, two seventy five over eighteen, uh, jailing this uh, this uh, this uh, absence wire. So you see the the wire now is jailed. And this is uh, uh, optimization, so pot with a short 325, uh, uh, very short 8 millimeter, just to stay within this landing zone. Uh, uh, and this is the result after optimization. So you definitely see that there is something uh, not good with uh, with diagonal. It often happens, so this is a pinch, so we always wonder whether we, to treat it or not. Now we have very clear solution, because we have the wire in place, so we don't need to do anything more, just connect and and check and uh, you see th this lesion was very very significant so this dpr 0 0.554 so definitely we should do something about this and uh, and uh, the question is is this kind of measurements reliable so this is just one of the uh, proof that uh, when you can see a very good correlation between uh, free floating wire and the jailed wire so these are uh, uh, bench studies uh, there is a more uh, studies like that uh, showing that th th this kind of measurements with a jailed wire uh, by the main vessel stent are uh, measurements are reliable uh, so we did just uh, replace it with a workhorse wire that uh, uh, kissing uh, repot and now of course you see again the this diagonal looked much better you see angiographic result the 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 FFR or DPR is not optimal, but keep in mind that this is a patient with aortic stenosis, 90 years old. So we don't, I, we didn't think that we really have to optimize and go above 0.9. So we decided to leave this diagonal like that. Uh, also, the LAD uh, not above 0.9, 9, but again, you remember this the step step uh, stepwise. Uh, decrease in 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 in, in, in measurements because of the very diffuse in, uh, disease in the elderly lady. Uh, so this is uh, this is final result. Uh, and geographically, it looks uh, it looks perfect. But of course, we we keep in mind that there, there may be uh, mm, uh, very diffuse disease. Uh, unfortunately, I was not. I didn't have this this nice uh, in modern OCT, so I didn't interrogate it with with um, imaging. So in conclusion. I think that this is a, a kind of breakthrough in the bifurcation stenting. If we are really able to jail this kind of wire, uh, which is really very reliable, yeah, with the uh, optical uh, sensor, so almost no drift, uh, as uh, Tom men mentioned. Uh, uh, so this is a very simple technique uh, of obtaining a, a really reliable functional assessment of side branch with uh, jailed uh, wire. But of course. Uh, the safety of this uh, strategy must be warranted. I think we need uh, some uh, clinical studies in this field to confirm the, the, the reliability and, and safety of, of this approach. Thank you very much for your attention. So we still have time for, for discussion. So, Tom, do we have any, any questions from uh, from the audience? No, nothing more from the audience. You've got. Yeah, yep. there is one question. Please use your microphone. We'll, ju we'll just okay? get a microphone because it's being recorded, if we can. Regarding your experience to use a, a, a jail wire, which is your experience with use this wire to recross directly after stent? Uh, so, not, so not with the standard and then predilate and then the, the ops wire, but directly. So, so you saw that in this procedure, I had to re remove and uh, re reinsert the wire a couple of times because I started with the LED, then then I moved to 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 the diagonal, then I jail the wire, so that I have to remove it after the, the jailing and uh, and stand optimization. 
but of course I measured. So this wire behaves generally like an, any regular wire. So I would re I would compare it to, to BMW or something like that because of this. Tom mentioned that most of the piezoelectric wires are eccentric. So 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 the the the, the wires that the the goes not in a central uh, cross section of the wire. This wire is is uh, is uh, concentric. So so this is just one single core going uh, throughout the, the the wire. So behavior of the of this wire is much more uh, like uh, um, workers wire as compared to 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 like BMW or, or Cyan Blue, the wires we use uh, in our daily pra practice. Uh, and of course, uh, another story is what happens with this uh, wire after J-Link. And I must admit, I don't have a very robust, you know, uh, experience uh, with this kind of procedures because you 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 not often need to to check the the um, uh, the, the significance uh, with uh, with um, physiology of of a side branch. But I think that given the fact that uh, the, the centrality of the of the um, uh, core location and uh, uh, the the lack of drift, because uh, the drift is bl close to zero with the with, with this wire. Uh, I think this will be a very useful tool. But of course, we need some confirmation in in in, in more clinical and of course more clinical data. But I, I think to just emphasize that it is it's important to recognize that the the historical pressure wire technologies it's it's really contraindicated to jail the wire for fear of the fact the wire will yeah. will. So um, no, none defective. of the company will let you jail the wire, you know, from from the competitors. Yeah. And so this is this is important data to demonstrate that utility. Now we've had data already in the meeting at the Kiss trial suggesting you don't need to kiss, but that's a kind <coughs> of fairly blunderbuss approach to taking all bifurcations and saying in the main we don't. But to have, we all surely have been in that situation where you're left with a tint, pinched vessel, maybe with slight reduction in flow, and there's a concern around should we, shouldn't we? But this connection, reconnection, disconnection ability of the opsends and the fact that you can confidently leave it jailed in the vessel and can make further assessment without that need for reinstrumentation allows you then to make some real time decisions and to guide your need for further optimization, <laughs> kissing balloon inflation. I, I just extend that obviously this case that I'd like to share in more detail was a a complex two stent where the opsense behaved like a workhorse and I used as a workhorse throughout the procedure. So I have to say it, it, it was impressive the way that it handled in what's really a very challenging uh, yeah. procedure. Of course, you have to do it very careful. You can you can break any wire if you try enough. You know you can you can, you can break wire. You can break catheters. So so it, it happens. Uh, but with this wire, everything went uh, r very smooth, and I would compare it to a, just a regular workers' wire we use for for this kind of stuff. So I guess what I was expecting was a bit of a backlash from at least someone in the audience to say this cannot be prime time. How can we justify the use of two technologies that cost additional money? So. I mean, who, who in the room is undertaking procedures using both physiology and imaging combined? Show of hands. A very small number, so maybe just 5%. Who, after the sharing of these presentations, is more inclined to consider, if you had a limitless budget, the use of combined <laughs> physiology and imaging to guide your potential outcome? So we've got about 50%. Let me rephrase that. If this were your LED and diagonal, <laughs> would you like me to use pressure wire and imaging to achieve the optimal result? Hands up. <laughs> oh, okay, you know, well, you keep true to yourselves. Um, right, okay. Okay, any, any, any more questions or comments? Yours? No, I think it was a great session. Uh, I think this specifically the latter discussion was interesting. I mean, there's a lot of focus this meeting again on long-term follow-up on bifurcation stenting trials. You will learn that two stents is usually not better than one stent. And uh, they may have a role in case it's needed, but whether or not it's needed, it's impossible to adjudicate based on the angiogram. And I think that's where this technology in particular may help you to change the way you treat bifurcations. And uh, that will allow you to save a lot of seconds, two stand procedures, with a lot of time, effort, contrast, additional ballooning, kissing, potting, etc. So I think with this technology, um, try it, and it, you will convince yourself that the, uh, the this is not like the routine uh, pressure wires you're used to use.
Before my check concludes, there are a couple more comments, and thank you for the interaction through the session, because it really does help. So Daniel Friedman in the room has said, is there no need for zeroing on multiple corrections? So that, again, as, as emphasized in the technology appraisal, Correct. is one of the beauties yep. of the wire, is the, is the lack of drift in comparison to um, older generation wires. And then another more slight, slightly controversial by anonymous, you brave individual, is stable angina, why not medical therapy since you have good TIMI 3 pre and post lesions? So this was an acute coronary syndrome with evidence of thrombus in an uh, underdeployed stent in the LAD where there was an absolute need to optimize. And then as we saw, a very high risk plaque within the circumflex which was positive by physiology, we could have a whole meeting on vulnerable plaque versus not, but I think there was good justification for treatment of both lesions in that acute setting. But my check. Yeah, yeah. so this is how we come to, to, to the end of this session. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I believe that through this uh, insightful presentation and our engaging uh, discussion, we all have gained uh, a deep understanding uh, uh, of how the combining of both physiology and imaging, uh, so how the combining those two tools uh, can optimize uh, and to lead to higher precision of our procedures and of course everything in the sake of uh, our patients. So I want to extend my heartfelt uh, thank to all of you, to your very active uh, particip participation. Uh, and uh, to, to your engagement, also to, to, to the panel and presenters and discussant. Uh, enjoy the rest of the course, and thank you very much again. Thank you.